Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to the Design Infrastructure Alley at DAC in 2019. So glad to see everyone back. I know that we've got uh, the keynote that's just kind of rolling out over here, but we're gonna go ahead and, and get started. We're set to start at 10, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So here we are again, back at DAC, second year in a row. Before I jump into my prepared remarks, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and give some thanks to the folks who made this whole thing possible. Uh, I wanted to take a moment and give some thanks to all of the exhibitors. We've got a ton of great exhibitors right down the road here in the Design Infrastructure Alley. Um, their sponsorship has made it possible for all of us to be here. And I want to thank all of you for being here as well. Uh, we're here to talk about how we can improve the design environment for the future. And uh, the folks who are there down the row on Infrastructure Alley are part of that solution. So be sure and stop by and talk with them while you're here. They've got great things to, to share with you. I also wanted to give a, a big thanks to our Design on Cloud Pavilion sponsor, Google. Uh, thanks to them, we've got this wonderful stage and the, the great uh, TV screen here behind us. Uh, thanks a lot, Google, for your participation. Google's got their booth right down there. Uh, be sure and talk with them about their Google Cloud platform and how they're using Google Cloud to uh, design chips for themselves. And then finally, I wanted to give some special thanks. Um, the Design Infrastructure Alley wouldn't be possible without the support of the DAC Organizing Committee. Uh, the ACM, the IEEE, uh, you know, they, they believed in this. They believed in the vision of talking about the infrastructure that's required to make chips, uh, and, and they allowed that to happen, so thank you so much, folks. Patrick Filippelli of Hall Erickson, he did a lot of uh, hard work working with all the exhibitors and logistics and getting things put into place so that we could be here this week. And Michelle Clancy of Cayenne Communications. Michelle is the communications chair for DAC this year, and she's done a tremendous amount of work to help us promote this event and make sure that you guys had awareness of it. So uh, I wanted to thank all of them sincerely for their work in making this happen. So two years ago, I started off by going to the DAC organizing committee and saying, hey folks, every year we gather at DAC, we talk about new tools and methods to create new chips and new systems, but we never talk about the infrastructure that's needed to use those tools. Uh, and I showed this slide last year, right, because it was our first year, but here we are in the second year of the Design Infrastructure Alley, and I'm really pleased to say that uh, every year we get together at DAC, and now we talk about the infrastructure that's needed to create all of these wonderful chips and tools. Um, and it's a vital component of the entire ecosystem that's required for all of the stuff that's in the other parts of this uh, great uh, center to work. Uh, and, and we're here to talk about how we can make it even more efficient. So I'm going to give a slight plug to my alma mater here. This is the main building of the University of Texas at Austin. And um, at UT, if you ever watch any of our sporting events, and hopefully you'll get a chance to this year because the football team will be doing better, we hope, um, they have a little tagline that they talk about. And the tagline is, what starts here changes the world. And I've always liked that tagline. I think that it's really good. And when I think about it, I was thinking about this uh, presentation in the context of DAC. It really kind of resonated with me that, you know, what starts here at DAC changes the industry. Here at DAC, we've got the best and the brightest from all of the different uh, companies in the semiconductor space showing up and talking about new discoveries that they've made, new theories on how to do things better. Well, here in the Infrastructure Alley, we're here to talk about how we can take uh, an infrastructure that's firmly rooted in the 1990s, and maybe even a little bit before that, and start to embrace new technologies, and how we can be even more resilient, how we can be more um, performant, uh, and how we can be more uh, scalable than we ever have been before. And so I wanted to, to kind of preface my th thoughts today with what starts here at DAC can change the industry. And you know, if you think about what happens in the semiconductor industry uh, and our original tagline, you know, what's in everyone's pockets, what's in everyone's laps, you got laptops, there's, there's semiconductor content all around us. So I mean, really, it's not a stretch to say that what starts here at DAC can in fact change the world. So 
uh, it's, it's thrilling to be a part of that, and I hope that you're all ready to be a part of it too. So the, the talk, the, the, the title of my talk today uh, was The State of the Future. Uh, and as I was preparing my slides, I thought that, you know, thinking about the cloud, thinking about the future of how things are going to work, I think it's instructive for us to go back to the future and think about another disruptive technology in the semiconductor space and how we went from that'll never happen to ubiquity. Um, and that transformation was the transition from Solaris to Linux. Now I'm going to talk about this from my own kind of personal perspective. If those of you who are in the audience were around for the transition from Solaris to Linux, maybe what you experienced was a little bit different and maybe it was a little bit the same. Uh, but when I was thinking about how we're going to get to the cloud, uh, sorry, how we're going to get to the cloud and, uh, and how we got to Linux, I was thinking about the stages of what I'll call the stages of acceptance. Uh, other people call it different things, but there's, there's some very defined steps involved. So the first stage is denial, um, uh, whenever you're talking about something new. And, and this, uh, this little picture here, this is the storming of the Bastille. And uh, when I think about when Linux started, uh, I kind of think about all the, the guys who were out there with pitchforks and torches. That, that was engineering. And engineering was coming to us, IT, who were kind of sitting in the fortress of the Bastille saying, guys, I've got to have Linux. You know, this, this, this thing, there's, there's, it, it's going to run so much faster, it's so much cheaper, we need you to do it. I know you like Solaris, it's a great operating system, but, you know, we really need you to start looking at Linux. And we would say to them, oh, no, guys, come on now. Linux is a toy operating system. Uh, it's shareware. Does anyone remember the term shareware from way back when? Uh, you know, shareware had this kind of pejorative term to it. It was, it was something that you couldn't count on. It was something that you could, you download it off the internet, who knows whether it really worked or not. If you had trouble with it, too bad. You know, maybe you could get some help, but you probably couldn't count on it. We would say, no, Linux isn't as stable. There's, there's no way that, that, you know, you guys would accept the level of stability that we'd be able to get out of Linux. It's just not there. Solaris is rock solid. It's the industry leader. We know exactly how it works. And, and by the way, there's no support for this thing, right? We, if, if we have a problem with it, if there's a kernel issue, maybe let's say the auto mounter doesn't work as we would like it to work, um, you know, you're out of luck. And engineering would say, okay, well, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, all right, we'll, we'll go back. Except engineering kept coming back to us, and they kept saying, we need this Linux thing, right? Uh, and, and so once we got past the, the first stage of denial, there we go. We entered the stage of resistance, right? So when engineering came back to us the next time to say, guys, I know that you said that Linux doesn't work and, and it's it, uh, no support and all that, but we really need you to support Linux. We would say, okay, guys, look, here's the thing. The core services that we need for Linux, just they're not, we, we don't think we can count on them, right? N NIS, who remembers NIS, right? You know, NIS was a big deal. Some people are still running that, I believe. Uh, and I think they're running it for performance reasons, but um, you know NFS, we don't know if NFS is as stable, uh, the auto mounter may not work as well, all kinds of things, right? The scheduler, you know, hey, I, I don't know if LSF works or not, I don't know if our scheduler of choice works, the, there were key enablers um, at the time. Uh, some of us were using what was then rational clear case. Hey, does rational clear case work on Linux? I don't know, and even if it does, I'm not too sure about the stability of that thing, right? And then there's the tool chain. Yeah, yeah, the simulators may work on there, but you know that not the full EDA tool chain works on Linux. Uh, you know, so I can't go replacing Solaris, which will run everything that we ha that we need to run with this other operating system over here that only runs a subset. So now you know we you know we we can't do that. And engineering would then go back and they'd say, well, you know, okay. Um, We'll, we'll come back later. And they came back later. Uh, and after we got out of the resistance stage, we moved on to bargaining. And bargaining took a couple of different forms, right? And I actually had an engineering manager tell me this. We sat in a room and he said, look, even if we lose half of our jobs, we'll just rerun everything and we'll still be okay. I won't have really lost anything. 
you know, so the, the stability issue that you guys keep talking about, I, I don't care about that as much as you think I do. They did, but it didn't matter. They, they, they were really wanting to have Linux, right? And so the other stage of bargaining uh, at this point turned into RFPs and RFQs. I think we finally got to the point where we said, look, we can't keep ignoring these guys anymore. We need to put together a formal document. We need to go through a formal process. We need to start looking at figuring out you know, whether or not we can really say no to this or not, or whether or not really this thing has legs. And it was around this time that people started to think, well, you know, maybe it's got something, I don't know. We, we have to go investigate it. And as we go, went through the, the bargaining phase uh, of acceptance to Linux, we, we were doing the RFPs, the RFQs, we started talking to vendors. And that's when we started to realize that we were entering the next stage, which was depression. And that, that, that depression stage was when we started to realize a lot of the reasons that we said we couldn't do this really aren't there anymore. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember this, but this was a big deal at the time. IBM announced that they were investing a billion dollars in Linux because they believed in it so much. That caught a lot of people's attention. Uh, a lot of people have said, hey, if IBM's willing to spend a billion dollars on this thing, there's, there's got to be something there, right? It was around this time that Red Hat was formed and SUSE was out there, and so now all of a sudden you could get commercial support for Linux. That was something that we didn't have before. LSF was working, you know, SunGrid Engine was, uh, was out there, the schedulers were out there, the tool chain, uh, ClearCase was working on it, much to everyone's surprise at the time. So we had to come to grips with the fact that all of the reasons that we gave for this thing not being able to be used were, were disappearing in front of our eyes. And as at this point, you know, we all know, the next step beyond depression was acceptance. And here we are 20-ish years later, and Linux now rules the EDA world. Um, with one important caveat, and that is the auto mounter still doesn't work as well as it did in Solaris, uh, as much as we would like it to, but it's gotten a lot better, right? Uh, but the point of that is, is that we went through all of these different stages around Linux from saying flat out, no, there's no way that this will ever work, to now, can anyone imagine what an EDA environment would look like today without Linux in the data center? It's, it's really unfathomable, to be honest with you, right? So why did Linux win? So, you know, I, I kind of broke it down. There's, there's probably more reasons than this, but to me the key ones were performance, right? It was a 2x performance improvement over what you were getting out of the Spark architecture, or PA risk, or you know whatever else you were using, if you were using uh, HPUX or AIX. From a value perspective, it was half the price per CPU of Spark. Um, and, and it's really hard to argue with half the price and twice the performance, right? Uh, the reliability, the reliability was about 80% of the stability and reliability of Solaris. Uh, but it was good enough. And you know, any of you who have gone to any kind of a marketing class or anything like that uh, and have, have learned about the, the, the VHS versus Betamax tape wars, Betamax was a superior format to VHS, but VHS won because it was cheaper and it did the job, right? And uh, that was kind of what happened with Linux, is that it was cheaper and it got the job done good enough. Uh, there was supportability, there was commercial support for it. Uh, and then on a portability perspective, it was just, you were swapping out Solaris for Linux, and maybe you had to go recompile some code, maybe you had to go rework a shell script or a Perl script or something uh, that helped, did slightly different things on Linux than it did on Solaris. But the refactoring process was not uh, a, a major endeavor. It was something that could be done pretty easily and quickly. So that's, you know, and you look back on it now, and it seems inevitable that Linux would have won. You, you look back on it now and it's, why would I have ever thought anything different? Well, at the time, it didn't feel that way at all. And so, keeping that history kind of in our back pocket, I wanted to pivot now a little bit and start talking about the, the real reason that I'm here today, which is you know, the state of the future. Now let's think about the lessons that we learned with Linux adoption, with where we are 
as an industry on things like adoption of the cloud and newer paradigms of computing for EDA and engineering IT. So uh, before I jump into some of the technical reasons, I'm gonna put a marketing type slide up here. Um, this is a concept from a guy named Jeffrey Moore. He wrote a book a while ago now called Crossing the Chasm. And he had this thesis that in any new product technology adoption, there's this normal curve. And at each of the uh, uh, sigmas, uh, the standard deviation points, you've got defined groups of people. And on the left-hand side, in the, the kind of yellowish area, you've got a really small group of people called innovators. And innovators are people who you can give them a half-baked idea without really uh, any form, and they immediately understand what the potential of that idea is, and they get really excited about it, and they want to work with you about it. And they love new stuff. And then the next uh, seg uh, sigma is what's called the early adopters. Now, the early adopters also get excited at half-baked ideas, but they get a lot more excited when you've got what's called a minimum viable product. They can deal with a very minimalistic set of functionality as long as it solves a problem for them. And then you've got what's called the chasm. And that chasm is a huge gulf in between the folks who are called the early adopters and what's called the early majority. And the early majority is when you really start to get broad market adoption of a particular product. And the reason that the chasm exists is because once you get into these people who are in the early majority, they don't want a minimum viable product. They want a whole product solution. And then you've got the other areas behind it, right? The late majority and then the laggards, right? Uh, the late majority needs to see people in the early majority taking a product up. They don't want to be the first uh, to, to do this, but they, they see the value of it and they know that there's a real thing behind it, but they need to see more proof. Uh, and the late majority, they follow behind them. The laggards are the folks. Uh, I think we all know people or companies like this. They've run whatever it is that they're running into the dirt. It's time for them to buy something. They can't, ex they, 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 they can't keep going with what they've got. And so now that they're finally at a point where they can buy something new, they're like, well, we might as well do this thing because everyone else seems to be doing it. So that's, that's just a brief marketing lesson on uh, the, the kinds of people who take things up. And I wanted to take both of these concepts, the stages of uh, acceptance and this crossing the chasm thing, and I wanted to kind of juxtapose them a little bit because when I originally was putting this together, I was thinking to myself, where can I say we as an industry are on the acceptance curve for cloud vis-a-vis -vis where we were with Linux? And I think that the more I thought about it, I realized that as an industry, we're not in one place. Lots of different companies are in lots of different places on the adoption curve. So you've got the innovators, they're already at acceptance. Uh, you've got the early adopters, they may be transitioning from depression into acceptance. You got the early majority who are probably still in the bargaining phase. Uh, you've got the late majority who are maybe in resistance and then of course there's the laggards, they still are in denial that this cloud thing is ever gonna take off. I'm just not sure about this, right? And of course, momentum is building, but the, the real question I think to ask ourselves is, is the cloud currently in the chasm? Is it in that no man's land in between the early adopters and the early majority? So I wanted to kind of take a look. Let's, let's recall from that previous slide that the difference between the early adopters and the early majority is, is that early adopters are okay with a minimum viable product. Early majority has to have a fully baked product. So I want to walk through uh, some of the discipline areas that we use for the Association of High Performance Computing Professionals and evaluate cloud on some of those characteristics. And let's think about where cloud is in terms of whether or not it's a minimum viable product in terms of the functionality that semiconductor companies need or whether or not we have a fully baked product. So we'll start off with grid computing, okay? So grid computing, here's the good stuff that you got, right? You got the availability of schedulers. LSF, UGE, Altair's Accelerator, Slurm, you know, there's all kinds of solutions that are out there for you 
if you want uh, to take the scheduler that you're already using and bring it into the cloud. So that's good news, right? There is an absolute plethora of compute types. Uh, if you want something that's got four gigs of RAM per processor, eight gigs, 16 gigs, you've got all kinds of choices. Um, there's, there's really no shortage of them. And there are specialty instances that are out there uh, that are really things that we don't make use of a lot yet, but we really could, should start looking at more of, right? Like GPU instances, FPGA instances, TPUs. Uh, there's all kinds of different good things going on in the grid computing space on the cloud. Unfortunately, my, uh, <laughs> my icons didn't make it through, unfortunately, but these are the things that aren't so good, right? Um, there's old tool versions that tie you to old OS releases. Those old OS releases mean that you can't run on the fastest and latest instance types in some cases. Uh, there are drivers that are needed for networking, for instance, or for storage that don't let you take advantage of those. So that's, that's kind of a problem, and that's an industry problem uh, for us. And another issue is, is that services are still scale up and not scale out. And what I mean by that is, and I'm gonna pick a little bit on uh, my scheduler LSF. If I want to double, triple, quadruple the size of my compute farm on LSF, you know, if I wanna do that on the cloud, I can do that you know, in a few hours or days or something like that, right? Of course, it doesn't work that fast on-prem. But I have to be careful with that because you've got this huge scalability in the cloud but I'm still tied with my LSF master server to one particular compute instance. And there's only so many cores, and there's only so much RAM that I can have on that before I throw more compute instances, more jobs per hour, more whatever, to the point that the scheduler just can't keep up, and now I've gotta start segmenting things. And if I wanna control things in a, in a large, uh, homogenous environment, uh, I don't have that ability. Now those problems in and of themselves are not necessarily cloud specific. Uh, the old tool versions, that's kind of on us as an industry. Uh, and the services, that's a conversation that we need to be having with our suppliers. And I, I picked a little bit on LSF. I don't want to uh, make it seem like they're the only ones who have that problem, right? There are loads of infrastructure services out there that suffer from that same problem of scalability. I can only scale out so much. So that's where we are with grid computing. Let's talk a little bit now about storage, right? So the good news for storage is there's lots of solutions in the market. You've got Avere, Elastifile, IC Manage, KMesh, NetApp, Pure, Weka, there are others, there are startups happening all the time in the storage space. There's no shortage of uh, storage, there's no shortage of storage startups to, that are working on or to some degree have solved some of the problems um, with cloud storage, whether they be uh, data movement or performance. Uh, knowing what to bring over is actually a solvable problem now. So um, yesterday we had a great workshop uh, that included Dr. Rosemary Francis from a company called Alexis based in Cambridge. Uh, they have a couple of great products that you can use to get a uh, bill of materials when you run a flow through to understand exactly which storage areas you're accessing. And that's an absolutely critical thing if you're gonna bring anything into the cloud uh, because many of us have been around for 20 plus years. There's lots of things that are hiding in your NFS storage that you don't even know that you need. But if you try and run without them, you'll quickly find out you absolutely need them. Uh, and that's been a very difficult problem to solve, but it is solvable. And uh, there may be other solutions outside of uh, Alexis, but that's, a, that's one that I know, and it's, it's a good one. It's uh, worth talking to those folks if you're looking to figure out where your NFS uh, dependencies are. Now, those are the good things. The not so good things, data synchronization is still a huge challenge. Knowing, you know what to bring, but do you do a lift and shift and bring over hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes or even petabytes of storage? Well, that takes a long time and it could be very expensive and maybe you only need a subset. Um, it's a huge challenge for the industry. Uh, and then finally, native cloud NFS offerings have varying levels of performance with high concurrency. And the fact is, I think that there's been benchmarking and testing, uh, but there's not a lot of places that are running at a really high level of concurrency yet on some of the storage options that are being provided by some of the, uh, the tier one cloud providers. And I have no doubt in my mind that as they get experience with those, that they will iterate on those 
Uh, the big cloud providers, you know, I've worked with, uh, with most of them, and they are really good about listening to customer feedback and working with you on it. But I would still put this in the realm of untested in terms of real battle scarring. Well, moving on, data security. So on the data security front, the good news for the cloud is you can encrypt almost anything in transit and at rest. There's very few things, particularly when it comes to your data at rest, you can just encrypt everything. And that's, that's an absolutely critical thing. Uh, the, big store, the big cloud providers, they spend more on security than a lot of us, or most of us, I should say, spend on our entire IT departments for the entire year. Um, they are really dialed in to the security question. So if, if you still have doubts about security in the cloud, you really should talk to those folks because I think that they'll, uh, they'll, they'll give you a much better sense of what's really there. But encryption is everywhere. It's prevalent out there. It's easy uh, to use. There's lots of APIs and ways to automate stuff. It's very scalable. Now the good news is, is that if you start looking at a cloud migration plan, it can help kickstart your on-prem controls. And that's an area that most of us kind of have struggled with over the years, uh, is, is having a good data migration, uh, a data uh, governance plan. And that's one of the bad things, right? A lot of us don't have well-defined data governance models. Well-defined well data governance models are really hard to implement because you have to keep engineers working while you're making the IP safe. And our legacy history was we need engineers to be able to share anything so that they can in, uh, reduce time to market. And now we're trying to figure out how do we let engineers share, but share within boundaries and limits. And that's a hard problem to solve. And then NFS v3 and auth sys are still dominant. And this may be a big deal to some, it may not be a big deal to others. Uh, but auth sys, you know, if you're not familiar with it, that's the thing where the storage says, oh, I trust you, compute server. You say that you are URD 123? Well, I believe that. Uh, and that's a really insecure way of uh, authenticating someone against storage. I know that uh, there are certain security folks out there who don't like that. They'd much rather see Kerberized NFS v3 or NFS v4. Um, but a lot of us haven't taken that up because there's usually a performance hit. Um, and it's not that NFS v4 isn't available in the cloud, but a lot of us still rely on the premise of NFS v3. And we tend to bring things with us into the cloud. And then finally, license management. So the good news on license management is EDA vendors let you host licenses in your own private cloud. You usually have to sign an agreement to say, oh, I promise I won't do anything naughty, um, and, and you can host licenses in the cloud. Uh, and there are hosted cloud offerings from major uh, suppliers, right? If you look right behind us over there, uh, the Cadence booth, they've got uh, some live demos going on of their cloud platform. Uh, Cadence in particular has invested a lot, but um, you know, Ansys and uh, Synopsys, they're also playing in the cloud space. There might be others as well. Uh, so the, the, the vendors are, are starting to offer their licenses in the cloud. Uh, but the bad news is, is that there's no elastic or scalable licensing in the cloud. We're still kind of stuck with fixed price, fixed capacity. If you want more licenses, you have to go ask someone for them. You have to generate a PO, and then you get your licenses. Uh, and maybe if you've added a bunch of licenses, you've got to go and add more license servers to the mix, and now you've got to go update your license paths. So there's, there's a lot of complexity involved, actually, if you want to add licenses. Um, but then if you want to take those licenses back, there's complexity in that as well. So there's not a really good elastic scalable licensing model for the cloud yet. Uh, and then finally, cloud license pricing isn't in line with the rest of the cloud consumption model. Um, it's not an on-demand thing. You can't just go start using more licenses uh, like you can. I can go order 10,000 more CPU cores. I can put a petabyte of storage online, but I still got to call someone for licenses. All right, so all that being said, we've looked through all these different things. What does all of it really mean? Where does the cloud stand? And so hearkening back to my Linux comparison, uh, I'm going, to show, I'm going to talk a little bit about Linux versus the cloud and the areas I talked about before, right? So on performance, Linux was 2x the performance increase per CPU core. Now the cloud, well, you know, on the CPU front, you're at least as good as what you've got on-prem, right? There's, there's, there's no question about that. They've got a lot of good CPU cores out there. Storage, your mileage may vary. 
And a lot of that's going to depend on what you've selected as your vendor, whether you use something that's native, whether you use a third party one, how you configure it, what your use model is. There's lots of factors yet that go into that. On the value side, Linux was half the acquisition cost. On the cloud side, well, it's not really a cost play, to be honest with you. Um, the cloud gives you massive parallelism and the ability to make your infrastructure code and you can spin things up and spin things down uh, with their flexibility and their less elasticity in a way that you can't do on-prem. You know, I don't know about you guys, but if we have to go order more servers, it's a multi-month process to go through the justification, getting the PO cut, getting the order made, getting the equipment in. In the cloud, you click a few buttons and you're able to go once you've got that budget approval. Reliability. Linux was 80% the reliability of uh, Solaris. The cloud's 110% more reliable than what we've got in, in our own data centers. Um, they have spent so much money on phys things like physical security, networking, logical security. Uh, you know, none of them publish the addresses of where their uh, data centers are. So, and, and they've got tons of resiliency built in and monitoring. So, uh, they are really good at that, uh, that and, and they're frankly better at it than we are because they focus on it. We're semiconductor companies, we're not IT companies. Uh, supportability, you know, you got commercial support for both. You got oodles of commercial support. Anyone's willing to take your money and take your call, well, whether you're on Linux or on the cloud. Portability, so on the portability front, um, Linux was a really, it was a straight shot to go from Solaris to Linux. You were taking one Unix operating system and replacing it with another Unix operating system. The cloud is a slightly different comparison though. So when you're talking about the cloud, you're talking about transporting an entire data center ecosystem from one place and into the other. And it's not necessarily a direct translation. And the other problem with it is, is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of legacy cruft that exists inside of our data centers that if you bring with you into the cloud, it really makes it more painful, it makes it more expensive. Um, it's better if you had more cloud native things, but it's really difficult to change the engine on the plane while it's still flying. And that's what most IT transformation and engineering IT is usually. I gotta make this change, but I can't interrupt engineering schedules. And it's gonna work that way with cloud too. Cloud's gonna be this relief valve for many people. And uh, the relief valve has to accelerate things. It can't slow things down. So we, we've talked about a lot of things today. You know, let's talk about a little bit about what's happening today and what that means for the cloud. So, you know, what's happening today is that all the major cloud providers are pursuing EDA very aggressively. You've got AWS, you've got Microsoft Azure, you've got Google Cloud, they're all here at DAC. Two years in a row they're here at DAC. Uh, they're really interested in talking to you about it and they've put a lot of energy. There's been a ton of progress on all of those cloud vendors front in the last year uh, even. Uh, and, and they're gonna keep innovating and keep working on it. Uh, so be sure and talk to them, find out what the latest is. They've all got great news for you. The foundries are embracing the cloud, right? So, you know, when we were talking about Linux earlier, I was talking about some of our tool, tool chain and uh, infrastructure items that were needed. Well, you know, it's actually kind of important that the foundries are embracing the cloud as well. Uh, the PDKs are becoming available out there, and that's, that's really a necessary step in order for us to be able to make use of cloud ourselves. So that's very exciting. There's uh, lots of stuff uh, with, with the different foundries. Uh, I think it's the... Uh, uh, OIC initiative, I can't remember what it was. TSMC announced this uh, not too long ago. Uh, so important stuff there. We've got EDA suppliers who are in various stages of acceptance. You know, again, we got the Cadence booth in the design infrastructure alley. Um, you know, those guys are, are definitely here and in force at DAC. Uh, the other vendors are also embracing the cloud. I know that they are uh, working with the cloud suppliers and they're interested in talking to anyone who wants to you know, they want to hear if you're interested in using the cloud. So if you called them up and said, I want to use cloud, I guarantee you they'll call you back and have a conversation with you. End user experimentation is on the rise. I've talked anecdotally with lots of different companies 
and I hear lots of people saying, yeah, we're, we're, we're working with the cloud. And I, I sincerely hope that our experimentation with the cloud doesn't turn out to be the same way that we experimented with parallel file systems. Uh, we love to experiment with parallel file systems, but uh, to my knowledge, there aren't a lot of people who have actually deployed parallel file systems, right? Um, but there's a lot of people who are playing around with the cloud and trying to figure out how to make it work. And some of those problems that I talked about earlier, particularly in the storage arena, um, are, are daunting. Uh, and that's why a lot of people are still in the experimentation phase. Another reason why people are in the experimentation phase is the TCO and cost challenge, right? It's a challenge for, for companies that have existing CapEx investments. Um, you know, if you're a small startup, you know, startups are gonna go straight to the cloud, right? It doesn't make any sense for them to try and build their own data center. And in fact, later this week on Wednesday, you're going to hear from Astera Labs. Uh, Astera Labs is a startup uh, that I think just recently had a big um, press announcement about their first uh, release. I think that's what I saw. And uh, they're gonna come in and they're gonna talk about, as a startup, what it was like to use the cloud. And it's a really interesting talk. I've seen the slides. You should definitely be here on Wednesday to hear from that. But startups are gonna go straight to the cloud, like what you're gonna hear about in more detail on Wednesday. Um, but for larger, more established companies, that, that capital expenditure that you've got in data centers, plant property and equipment, cabling, servers, racks, people, that doesn't just fall off the books because you decide that you wanna to go to the cloud. And that's, that's probably gonna be one of the biggest challenges. And so I think that um, if you, if you kind of synthesize all of what's going on right now, the, the storage, the data storage challenges in terms of uh, data replication and synchronization and these TCO challenges are, are really the biggest ones that are what's keeping the cloud in that chasm area. Those are the things that in, my, in people's minds make it think that this, this product is really close, but it may not be quite yet what we need. And I know a lot of people think that way. The TCO challenge is really uh, an interesting one uh, because a lot of people want to see the numbers work out so that it's cheaper, um, but uh, it's really important to keep in mind that the cloud gives you some burst capabilities that you don't have otherwise, and maybe if you're looking for a pure cost play, the cloud, at least in the short term, may not be the right option, but it can really accelerate your time to market if you're in a crunch in a way that you won't be able to do uh, in the short term. On, uh, in the short term on-prem, that is, sorry. Now, we talked a lot about where we are today in terms of cloud adoption, cloud acceptance, where we are with embracing new technologies. And I talk a lot about the cloud, and to me the cloud kind of sums up a lot of things with in, uh, uh, making our environments more modern and getting out of the 90s. But, and all these conversations that we're having here at DAC are great. But DAC is not even a full week, right? Um, it's a few days out of every year. And there's gonna be some great conversations that we're gonna have this week, whether they're here on the floor, whether they're in meetings, whether they're in networking events. There's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna get excited about ideas, and then they're gonna go back to their companies and they're gonna realize that they've got a pile of emails that they gotta read, right? I know that I will be. Um, these conversations, these things about modernizing, they don't happen overnight. They're, these are, these are multi-year kinds of conversations. And so we, might, we need a way to continue the conversation outside of DAC. And uh, that's where I'm gonna put a little plug in here for uh, the Association of High Performance Computing Professionals. We are a professional association for both customers and suppliers to collaborate on designing the future. So uh, our discipline areas are grid computing, storage management, license management, data security, and cloud. And we really encourage you to get involved with this organization uh, so that we can continue to have these conversations in an online way that bridges borders and time zones and all that other sort of good stuff. Uh, we have a great discussion board. We use a piece of open source software called Discourse. Um, it's really great. It lets you get email if email is your preferred mode of communication or there's a web interface. Um, you can sign up for it. We've got some thought-provoking blog posts and some guest bloggers that are on there. Um, we try to have monthly or quarterly per discipline calls. Uh, and we're, we haven't done any yet, but uh, if we get enough uh, participation, we'd love to start having some local networking events so that people can talk uh, when they're closer to home outside of just DAC. 
Uh, so please, get involved. We need some discipline leaders. I'd love to get some help with the, the, the grid computing space or storage, security. Um, if you're interested, talk to me, send me an email, go to the discourse board. A any way that you can get involved would be great. Uh, we need some help with the social committee, those local events, those would be great. Um, conference committee, we're going to need some help setting up for DAC next year, which, you know, I don't know if anyone's seen this. Uh, I, I got it pointed out to me this morning. There was a huge press release that came out just today that next year DAC and SemiCon are going to be co-located together in San Francisco. So that's a huge press announcement. Uh, so we're definitely going to be, oh, whoops, I, it doesn't work when you want it to and uh, anyway. Uh, so th that's a huge announcement. Um, if you've got opinions that you want to share, become a blog contributor. Um, so I've got a former colleague of mine named Rob Mallory who's very passionate about storage. He's posted a couple of things on the HPC Pro's website that have been very well received. If you're an expert in something and you want to get your opinion out there, it's a great way for you to get your name out there and to, get, uh, to, to show that how you're a thought leader. So that's the HPC Pro's pit. Um, I'm going to talk just a couple minutes here about some uh, logistics items. So there is a beer and wine reception at 5 o'clock here in the Design Infrastructure Alley. So you know, if you're thirsty at the end of the day, feel free to stop by, have a, have a, couple, of or a couple of drinks, and talk with some folks. Uh, and then if you're really thirsty, we have our networking event tomorrow night at Gordon Biersch, which is not too far from here. Uh, I think I've heard it's close enough to walk, but you'll probably want to Uber. Uh, join us for heavy hors d'oeuvres, beer and wine at Gordon Biersch. Everyone's going to get a couple of drink tickets. If you like more, there's a cash bar available. And I want to take a moment and thank our generous sponsors for this, uh, Altair, AWS, and IBM. Uh, they're the ones who are making this networking reception possible. So you know, feel free to stop by their booths and thank them for their generous sponsorship of this event. And finally, in closing, I just want to say that Welcome again to DAC this year. I'm super glad that everyone is, is here. I hope that you have a great week talking to all of the great exhibitors that we've got, and I hope that you have a great chance to network with some of your peers in the industry. Thank you very much, and have a great week.